Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to be speaking to you. And I think to, to the point that was brought up by Dr. Abel, I think it's, uh, it's truth really is wonderful to be here because a lot of our patients and our families inspire us to do and to, to care for. And so uh, it also gives motivation to try to move the field forward. So thanks for being here. Uh, and uh, it is, again, a privilege to be speaking to you today. So it, what I'd like to do first and foremost is I always find it's, it, you know, cases, and all of us have cases, all of you are demonstrations of, of the successes and some of the challenges in the management of kidney cancer, but to talk about a case that highlights metastasectomy, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and we'll, we'll sort of go and do a little bit of a deeper dive into the various sites of disease that kidney cancer can spread to, and what the resections entails, and what are some of the important characteristics. So this is a patient, uh, no identifiers from a patient standpoint, 60-year-old that I managed, I believe, about five years ago. But 11 centimeter renal mass, suspicious for a kidney cancer. Uh, lymph nodes were slightly enlarged and concerning. Two small spots in the lungs, which were not very clear whether they represented metastasis. And a bone metastasis, in fact, of, of an L3, so lumbar spine, uh, which uh, had not been symptomatic up until that point, but as we'll discuss, was fairly advanced in terms of its uh, potential compression and risk of fracturing. The patient really was in excellent performance status and remains uh, in that way. Go the other way. All right. What is Sorry, good question. So ECOG performance status is a way we, we ultimately uh, identify the type of performance or sh physical shape the patient is when we consider treatment considerations, whether that be surgery or other. So it's going. Correct, exactly. Zero means performance that's really very fit and in excellent shape. For some reason, he wants to go backwards. Okay. So this is uh, the patient's uh, imaging studies. I think we've gone through uh, several of these this morning. So you can see here the mass, which is suspicious of, uh, of a cancer. You see some lymph nodes as well. They're slightly enlarged uh, back here. And... Uh, this, again, were the spots in the lungs. Uh, they were not very large, really less than a centimeter, and as most of us clinically sort of say, is anything less than a centimeter is really equivocal and not very clear whether it's a metastasis or not. And this is the, uh, the area of the bone that you can see here, uh, quite large. Uh, again, patient had not been symptomatic from a neurological standpoint, but there was significant concern in that regard. And really, the question is, what do you offer that patient? Well, there's multiple treatments, as we discussed, and it was highlighted. I think the care at, at, at most of our centers is multidisciplinary. I think uh, surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, we really bring a little bit to the table all together, and I think we need to personalize the treatment of every single patient. So that's what typically happens in most major centers, and uh, I think, again, I emphasize that it has clearly been shown to offer the best uh, outcomes, ultimately, for patients. So really the question is, would this patient be offered upfront treatment with medical therapy? Uh, we had a great talk on some of these systemic therapies, uh, radiation, or really is surgery the right way to go? So really this was a, a case we discussed multidisciplinary, and it really was felt the lung lesions were not very clear. Uh, the bone area was significant concern that it could progress. And in fact, what we decided to do is do a combined surgical resection of the primary and the bone with uh, uh, discussion with our, some of our uh, surgical oncologists in the neurosurgical program. So patient underwent a cytoreductive, so removal of the kidney and setting of metastatic kidney cancer. So that's what we refer to as cytoreductive nephrectomy. A uh, lymph node dissection, removal of those lymph nodes, which I showed you, and then removal of that uh, uh, bony segment. Subsequent to which the patient had radiation uh, to the specific areas of the bone as well. Uh, a discussion point afterwards, and I know will be discussed, is whether there's a role of giving medical therapy afterwards to these patients. So the pathology, in fact, showed this was kidney cancer, uh, fairly aggressive type, firm and grade, grade clearly being a factor which tells you how aggressive ultimately the cancer is. The margins were clean, which is what this SM means. Lymph nodes were all positive that we resected, and the uh, bone area clearly was a metastasis as well. So what is the evidence to support this approach? Well, let's discuss that a little bit in detail. So as Dr. Wood mentioned, what is metastasectomy? So let's start with defining that. So that is the surgical removal of cancerous growths that have spread beyond the original tumor site to other sites of the body. So 
as we were discussing earlier in some of the talks, a meta-analysis is when you basically take all the data that's out there of high quality and you really look at it in detail and say, well, is there any really good conclusions we can make whether something has a benefit? So this is a study that was published several years ago uh, from the group of the Mayo Clinic. They looked at over 2,267 uh, patients who underwent metastasectomy and really try to identify whether, first of all, if you completely remove it versus incompletely remove it, does it make a difference? Well, I know intuitively that makes sense. If you remove all of it, you think you would do better. Well, they came to that conclusion. And how much of a benefit was there? Well, fairly significant difference when you look at overall survival differences between complete versus incomplete recession. You see 36.5 months versus 8.4 months. So bottom line, if you can completely remove it, you do better. So it's important, again, highlighting the point, when you have your care, make sure the people that are caring for you have expertise, know ultimately that they, they've done it before, and also they can discuss with you with some of the morbidity, main complications associated with that recession could be. So this is what we refer to as a forest plot, which is just a very fancy statistical way of saying, well, when you put all the data together, and these are the individual studies, the bottom line is there's a favorable to, uh, uh, prognosis associated with the complete resection. And that's, that, base, that two number means uh, essentially uh, two times greater, uh, I guess, uh, chance of cure, essentially. So this is another study that was published. Uh, this is a comprehensive review. Uh, it was published uh, looking at knowledge overall in terms of local treatments for metastasis and trying to come up with some conclusions. What, what conclusions did they come up with? Well, same thing. They came to the conclusion, if you can completely remove it, you do better. So I sort of hit that point. So this is just a good summary of, and it'll be sort of really the, uh, the discussion points we're going to sort of have in the next 20 to 25 minutes is, well, where does kidney cancer go to when you consider surgical resection? Well, the lungs are the most common site, so lung resections for metastasectomy is the most common. And this is the overall survival associated with metastasectomy specifically for lungs. So lung most common, bone is a very common area, liver as well, pancreas, lymph nodes, abdomen, and then thyroid and, and head and neck area. And you clearly see certain areas, for like for example, pancreas, that really have a, actually a very favorable prognosis in terms of how patients do. This is an interesting study that was published uh, last year, and really it was done as, as a study in Europe, but really they tried to look at subtypes of kidney cancer. So obviously today, we know more than just histology, meaning is it kidney cancer, is it a clear cell, or is it a non-clear cell? We actually know what kind of molecular profile, meaning what kind of genes these specific tumors are expressing. So this group lo looked specifically at the clear cell type of metastatic, metastatic kidney cancers and found there are really four different clones of cells based on their genetic profile. And I mention this just because this is a, a way of looking at the genes that are being expressed and what they ultimately uh, are involving in terms of how cancer progresses. And they, in fact, showed in a subsequent study that depending on what subtype of, of a clear cell kidney cancer you had, when you had a metastasectomy, you actually did better with certain subtypes. So that's some of the innovative type of research and, I think, uh, information we're now getting from genetics and from molecular profiling we now know, in addition to the subtype of kidney cancer, based on the genetic profile, how you may do with, with a complete resection of a metastasis. I would say, because uh, some, some colleagues have asked, that's not really being used widespread clinically, but it is clearly where research is going in the future in terms of how ultimately we determine which patient should undergo surgery. So uh, this is a paper that was published uh, from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York of 138 patients with metastatic uh, kidney cancer undergoing a single-site metastasectomy, meaning they only had one site which cancer had spread to. And what did they find? They found that patients in terms of recurrence-free and cancer-specific survival actually uh, did fairly better than expected. 84% of patients at five years had a cancer-specific survival. So something more encouraging than what we would typically associate with it. And what were factors that associate with how patients did? Large tumors and sarcomatoid histology. Sarcomatoid histology is a subtype of kidney cancer, which is very aggressive in its pattern of behavior, not only locally, meaning in the abdomen, but also in its pattern of spread to other areas. So those were the factors that were associated with how patients did. Another question that they answer is, is, no evidence that if you had metastasis when you were diagnosed with kidney cancer, you did any worse than if you developed a metastasis afterwards and underwent this type of surgical approach. So that was also a, a, an insightful type of conclusion or, or point that was brought up by this specific study.
And this is uh, the survival curve. So ultimately, if you look at cancer-specific survival, and I'll tell you what that ultimately means, is if you look at survival specific to that cancer, not meaning not looking at whether someone had a heart attack or another cause of death, you see that, again, patients did better than would be expected with about at five to six years, 75 patients were cancer-specific. I had a were cancer-free in, in that regard in terms of being alive following that resection. <coughs> So this study specifically looked at, well, you know, it's important, you know, that we clearly discuss prognosis in terms of how you do from a cancer standpoint, but an important discussion point for patients is, well, talk to me a little bit about the morbidity, meaning what kind of side effects am I going to have from this treatment? That applies not only to surgery, but medical therapy. You want to know what you're sort of looking into, what you can expect in terms of how likely you're going to recover from an operation. So this study looked at a national database of kidney cancer patients, looked at over a period of about 10 years, and found in the 1,100 patients that were looked at, major complications were, uh, were found in about 25 to 27% of patients. And it found, in fact, certain sites of resections did worse in terms of rates of complications, like liver resections, for example, were one of the areas where you had a two and a half times higher risk of having a complication. So these are also very important discussion points when you're discussing it as a clinician or as a clinical care team with patients in terms of what you can expect with a treatment. What were the most common complications? Things like transfusions, respiratory uh, complications, those are really the most common ones. Things like wound infections, things like, uh, like cardiac were really fairly low, about a 5% incidence of having those things. And that's also an important discussion point is today when we care for patients, and I'm sure many who had surgery, Patients are really very carefully scrutinized and evaluated by medical teams and cardiologists to really make sure you're in the best of shape when you're having an operation, particularly if you have some medical condition. So let's now talk about the individual sites of metastasis and how patients do with resection. So lung metastasectomy, and I'm going from a chronological from the highest frequency of, of sites of metastasis and resection to the lowest. So, Again, lung being the most frequent site that cancer can go to and where patients have had experience in terms of metastasectomy, what do we know? And I highlight this as just as this is a spot of metastasis or highly suspected, and in fact was biopsy proven to represent that. So this is a paper that was published from a group in China. Uh, they looked at a, looking at prognostic factors of patients with metastatic kidney cancer who had lung metastasectomy. So again, we like to talk about survival rates. Again, and I think it was a good point that was brought up by an earlier speaker, is it's, you have to be very careful when you say there's a one-year, three-year, five-year overall survival. Those are numbers. They don't necessarily mean how you're going to do. Anytime a patient asks me that, I sort of take a step back and say, look, I don't necessarily can tell you what you're, you're going to likely be in, in one, two, three, five, or, or ten years. I can give you numbers, but those are numbers. It doesn't say. Those curves are, you know, they span a certain thing, and they don't really represent everybody in this room or, or potentially who has kidney cancer. So you have to spend a little time and really be significantly educated as well as clinicians have to, have to really discuss that in a little bit of detail. So what were the factors that were associated with patients that did worse with a lung metastasectomy? Well, if your lymph nodes were involved, you did worse. If you had incomplete resection, like we were discussing earlier, you did worse. If you had multiple sites of, of spread within the lungs, you clearly had a, a, a less favorable prognosis. And so those are important factors for your clinician and for patients who have uh, lung metastasis or considering this to sort of be aware of. And again, this is a somewhat busy slide, but again, it, it really is to heighten, again, the fa various factors that are associated with how patients do. And again, um, to emphasize the point that you really need to take these individual prognostic factors or factors that predict how patients are going to do into account. This is another study that was published. Uh, uh, this is a, a study from Japan, and it looked at, interestingly enough, surgical resection of pulmonary metastases in a cohort of about 85 patients. And what they found is the five-year overall survival rate for the group of patients was about 59%. And complete resection, again, was achieved in 93% of patients. So surgeons did a pretty good job ensuring they had resected most of the disease. And the factors that predicted, again, how patients did were the size of the tumor, the histology, meaning if it was a clear cell, patients, in fact, did better in having a complete resection. And again, this highlights the point that clear cell ultimately in this group of patients was a, a very favorable prognostic factor versus other types of histologies of kidney cancer. Uh, 
This is a study that was published uh, from Germany, actually. It was, it was somewhat, I wouldn't say this is streamlined treatment to lung metastasectomy. They, in fact, not only resected it, but they used laser technology to ablate the area resection. So when they did the resection, they used a laser technique uh, to resect it, and they were, in fact, very aggressive. They didn't only resect patients with single-sided disease, but potentially some patients who had several sites of metastasis in the lungs. And I would take pause and sort of say that is not standard approach, but they sort of did this in Germany, and it sort of gives us a little bit of insight of how patients did. What did they find? They found that patients had a complete resection, again, did better, and it was achieved in about 88% of patients, even if they had several lung metastasis in the lungs. And in fact, the factors that predicted how patients did were complete resection and number of sites of metastasis in the lungs. So I would tell you clinically, uh, I take a little caution when I look at data like this, because if you have multiple sites of metastasis, particularly if it's in both lungs or you have other sites of disease, those are likely patients that you know, would be discussed as a multidisciplinary type approach, but probably would get some form of, of medical therapy first before you went on to do surgery. And again, this was to show that if you had one site of disease, you did better, but you see in this study, they did up to 20 resections in some of these patients, which again, I wouldn't say that would be a standard approach that most of us would sort of advocate for. Let's go on to bone metastasis. This is the picture I showed you earlier, again, with a fairly large bulky metastasis, which is at high risk of compression or, or, or causing some neurological deficits in patients. So this is a, a paper that's a couple of years old, but it was published from the group from Boston uh, Orthopedics Department in terms of doing bone metastasectomies. And they found, in fact, in 183 patients, which is a large group of patients who were treated, 48% of patients underwent metastasectomy, and then 30% of patients underwent some sort of curtage, meaning excision of the inside of, of, the, of the lesion. And essentially, the other 22% of patients didn't, in fact, have a, a, a resection. They underwent a stabilization. So an area was felt to be at high risk of a fracture, and the orthopedic surgeons just stabilized it. And really, the point of this is, is there a difference between resecting it versus stabilizing it? So they looked at this and, in fact, found that if you had a resection of the bone metastasis, you did better versus if you had any of these other two different types of approaches. And again, this is sort of shown in these survival curves where, again, if you have a complete resection with negative margins, you clearly do better. But really, if, whether it was an intraletal curtage versus a stabilization, really was no difference. So it's a really either you get a resection, complete resection versus other. And so those are important discussion points. And this is another thing, whether they achieve negative margins, which was confirmed with pathology, you clearly did better as well. This is a paper that was published as a collaboration uh, looking at bone metastasectomy treated in two places, in Germany and in China. They treated 114 patients. The overall survival was about 9.6 months. So clearly, you're seeing that bone metastasectomy, for example, is not as favorable as we were discussing earlier with lung metastasectomy. The factors that were associated with survival on multivariate analysis were whether patients had received some sort of med medical therapy at some point, either before or after surgery, uh, whether patients had a resection, whether patients were put on some forms of what I call bisphosphonate therapies, which are a way of, of really boosting and making sure you, you, you give, uh, reduce the risk of, of bone fractures by increasing bone health. And uh, favorable predictors of overall survival were those factors, in fact. And resection of bone metastasis in combination with medical therapy, in fact, was shown to have a dramatic improvement in survival with a 31, uh, close to 32 months survival versus eight months. People, in a, you know, and we spent some time discussing whenever you look at clinical studies, and I think that's an important point, I definitely spend time, and I'm sure my colleagues do the same, is you have to be very careful when you sort of come to a conclusion and say, well, if I have surgery and I get treatment, I do better than if I had treatment alone. Well, there's also a certain degree of selection that happens there, meaning who are going to get more aggressive therapy? Well, it's patients typically, like we're discussing about performance status, who are very fit, patients who are very, you know, are seeking a very aggressive approach, for example, and also patients potentially who are being treated at centers where they have the ability to give multidisciplinary care. So there's Anytime you see a study, there may be some factors which may be influencing the data as well. So just always take that into account whenever you look at some clinical studies. And again, when you look at it, patients who have bone metastasis, which you see in the blue curve, did better with whether they had single sites, so bone metastasis only, versus if they had multiple sites of disease, versus if they, in fact, had the bone metastasis left in place. And again, if combination therapy, meaning if you had medical therapy plus resection, they also did better.
How about hepatic and pancreatic metastasectomies? So this is, again, a, a CT scan showing the kidney is left in place here. The patient, in fact, had uh, the right kidney removed previously, and you see this area right here, which, in fact, is a pancreas metastasis that the patient developed. So what's the data in terms of these areas of, of, of metastasis and having surgical resection? So this is a 12-year follow-up study. So patients were followed over a 12-year period who have liver metastasis. And this is a paper that was published uh, from the Mayo Clinic over a period of about 11 years. The median number of liver metastasis were two. Uh, and the median fault of the patients was about 26 months, so a little bit more than two years. And they found that most of the patients had, in fact, received some form of systemic treatment, so medical therapy in addition to surgery alone. And they found that overall, the five-year survival rate was actually about 60%. And there were patients that survived at 142 months was the median survival. Factors which are associated with not benefiting from surgery, again, higher grade, more aggressive histology of the cancer, and having other sites of metastasis at that time. And this is sort of putting the data together, the survival rates. Again, you see there is, whenever you look at clinical studies, there can be a quite significant variation in terms of what are reported survival rates and how patients are doing. So that's also very important when you look at data or you have a discussion with your clinician to understand that there is variability in experiences and how patients do. And this is a paper specifically looking at isolated pancreatic metastasis. If you may remember, one of the first slides I showed was pancreatic metastasis in itself are, are, are a somewhat favorable location for, it, for metastasis of kidney cancer in terms of either medical therapy or surgical resection. So this is a, a study of uh, 276 patients. 28% of patients were treated with not only either surgery or radiotherapy, so either form of local treatment, and 256 patients received some form of systemic therapy, again, in addition to this type of local treatment. The median survival the patients had was about 58% at five years, and factors that were associated with overall survival was whether the patients, in fact, had some form of local treatment. On multivariate analysis, so multivariate analysis, as you all are probably aware, is when you take all the factors together and you're sort of controlling for potential things which may be skewing the data, what are the bottom line, what are the factors that are really impacting how patients do? So whether you had previous uh, kidney removal of the Memorial Sloan Kettering and IMDC prognostic factors, which is just basically ways that we've developed to understand how patients are going to do based on certain characteristics either of their tumor or, or using blood tests to sort of know a little bit more about their cancer, and, uh, and whether patients, in fact, had local treatments, either, again, in the form of radiation or in the form of surgery. And again, bottom line that was shown in this study, local therapy makes a difference when you have metastasis to the pancreas, and you clearly see that. These two curves are clearly very different. So this is a topic that my colleague, uh, Dr. Karam, will be discussing in the next few minutes. Uh, but so I, I sort of will sort of skim through this fairly quickly. But what happens when, when the cancer goes locally, meaning in the abdomen, either to lymph nodes, as seen here, and how do patients ultimately do? Does it make sense ultimately to go after it surgically, for example? So this is a paper that was pleased to collaborate with my friends in Texas. And uh, we looked at this, and we really found that the most common site of, of metastasis of the lymph nodes, specifically in terms of what in the abdomen has, has the cancer spread to, are the interaortocaval region, which means between the vena cava and the aorta. And I'll sort of going back there, that basically means in this specific area between these, these blood vessels. And uh, at a follow-up, uh, really of close to, I believe it was uh, two years, uh, it was found that about 52% of patients develop a subsequent recurrence. So about half of patients will recur once again after that, uh, that initial resection. And the time to a recurrence was close to uh, 10 months. On multivariate analysis, like we were discussing earlier, the factors which were predictive of how patients did ultimately was whether or not you had a short time from when you developed the recurrence. So Typically, if you have a, recur a short interval between when the recurrence happens, that, that is usually a, a worse prognostic factor, which you need to take into account. So if it comes back early, less favorable in terms of how patients could do. And uh, that was, in fact, the factor that was most predictive of progression. And what uh, we're able to do is really pinpoint a little bit more where were these typical lymph nodes in terms of where the cancer had spread to. And this is for left-sided tumors, so if you had a kidney cancer in your left kidney or right-sided tumors, uh, so in this kidney, 
where the spread to candy uh, cancer was spread to. And those are helpful for clinicians to sort of be aware of because when you're discussing going in there and removing lymph nodes, if you know there's a higher risk that other lymph nodes could be involved, it may sort of affect how you do the surgery or what lymph nodes ultimately you'd be removing. So uh, this is a paper, uh, again, from, the, from our colleagues at, at MD Anderson by Dr. Wood and Karam. They looked at 100 patients, 102 patients treated over a period of about 15 years, and they found that uh, metastasis progression was observed in about, again, slightly more than half of the patients. And on multivariate analysis, again, taking other factors, the nodal status, meaning if the lymph nodes were involved, and the diameter of the lymph nodes were the factors that predicted how patients ultimately did. And these are some of these survival curves, again, highlighting whether uh, you had a recurrence that happened early, you did worse, whether the lymph nodes were positive, a ton of surgery, you did worse. And also, this is an important curve, which, I apologize, I know it's a little small. The site where the cancer recurred, meaning if it was lymph nodes, you see that patients did slightly worse than, for example, if the cancer had come back in the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland being, as was discussed earlier, is that little gland that sits right on top of the kidney. So adrenal is a, is a more favorable location for these cancers to spread to. How about brain metastasis? You know, when, when, when this cancer spreads to the brain, people say, well, is there nothing that could potentially be done? Well, that's not the case. Uh, clearly, there are treatments that, that are available, and we'll discuss those uh, right now. So this is a paper that was published from the group from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and they looked at doing brain metastasectomy in 50 patients treated over a 20-year period. So you see that clearly that's a very large period of time, a uh, very selected patient of population. Some patients with brain metastasis typically today would be treated with radiation, for example, versus surgery. The primary was resected in most of these patients, and the median survival of patients was about 31 months. Mortality following surgery was found and happened in about 10%. So clearly, something very important for, for patients, families, and, and clinicians to discuss is there's still a, in this series, which was again several years ago, this was published close to 20 years ago, there's about a 10% mortality risk associated with the operation itself. And uh, following surgery, uh, close to half the patients, in fact, receive radiation treatment. And the reported one, two, three, and five year overall survival, and again, understanding that these are very general type numbers, are, are such that about five years overall survival is about 8.5%. Favorable predictors were whether the site of metastasis, you're going to say, what on earth does supertentorial metastasis means? If this was in the higher brain, patients typically did worse. Uh, patients who had left sided versus right sided tumors did worse. Not really sure how to explain that other than to say maybe that was just also maybe some statistical type reasons why that was. But also, if you had symptoms, neurological symptoms before surgery, you typically did worse as well. How about the head and neck? Um, so I've, I've had patients over the years who, for example, had developed a thyroid metastasis of kidney cancer. And actually, when you look at it, that is probably one of the more straightforward sites of, of surgical resection for our colleagues in the head and neck service to sort of operate on. And patients, uh, in fact, interestingly enough, Concurrence, meaning presence of thyroid and pancreas metastasis, was present in about a quarter of patients, with thyroid adrenal concurrent metastasis in about 13% of patients. The five-year overall survival rate was about 46%. And about 28% of patients develop a subsequent local recurrence in lymph nodes or other in the, in the general head and neck area. Again, on, on looking at all factors, what predicts how patients do? Well, age was a factor. Uh, patients who had involvement of adjacent cervical lymph nodes, for example, did typically worse. And predictors of how patients or who are, which patients are most likely to recur was invasion of these lymph nodes or how long ago the patient had the thyroidectomy. So short interval typically did worse than versus if you had a long interval, for example. So I, we were discussing a little bit earlier, well, is there a role to give medical therapy before you do these types of surgeries? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, our counterparts, uh, again, in Texas at MD Anderson have, have looked at this in a retrospective fashion. So looking at their data of patients they had treated, and they found that in 22 patients treated across three centers, uh, MD Anderson, Dana Farber, and the Cleveland Clinic, metastasectomy was found uh, in the retroperitoneum, meaning in the abdomen, in the lungs, so multiple areas of sites of cancer. And about 50% of patients had a recurrence at a, at a follow-up of close to three and a half years. And the median follow-up of about 109 weeks, 21 patients were alive, and one was deceased from kidney cancer. So these are, you see, in these retrospective studies, typically patients get a host of different type of medical therapy, either before or afterwards. 
And this is another paper that looked at this. This is a paper that was published in a European journal, and they looked at patients that got medical therapy before surgery. Again, same type of question. And the problem of proceeding with, with surgery after you got medical therapy was quite good. So sometimes patients ask, well, if I get medical therapy, am I burning my bridges that I may not have surgery afterwards? Well, this study would tell you not. Most of these patients, in fact, were able to have surgery. The median survival of these patients with the adjunct therapy was about 67 months, and the probability to achieve a complete local therapy and discontinue targeted therapy was about 73% of patients. So what does that mean? So probability that you get resected and you're off the treatments afterwards. So fairly good chance that you're going to be able to sort of get off the therapies in this, in this uh, experience right here. This is a fancy way of showing data where patients that got medical therapy, you want to know, bottom line, did the, the, the masses sort of shrink? Well, most of them, in fact, did when you look at percentage of shrinkage that you see here. And that's sort of what's represented. You clearly see one here which, in fact, grew during medical therapy. And that's what, as a clinician, as a patient, you need to watch out for. Is clearly, if the medical treatment's not doing it, you need to reassess whether you need to change treatments or maybe you need to consider surgery at that point in time. How about giving adjuvant, meaning giving treatment after you do the metastasectomy? Well, there definitely is, this is an active area of research, and I think there's a lot of interest, like Dr. Haas has mentioned earlier. I think the combinations, particularly in patients who are at risk of recurring, is something which we actively are looking at, and I think clinical trials is definitely going to be the way of looking at this. So this is a paper that was published uh, from South Korea of 33 patients who were treated following a complete resection and got some form of target therapy. And again, same thing as we were discussing before. If you had an incomplete resection, you did worse. And again, bottom line is it makes a difference. If you're going to have surgery, it's important that your surgeon and yourself have a clear discussion of the goals of treatment, the likelihood of a resection being complete, and sort of being able to sort of know and understand that. The factors that predict how patients did were, again, complete resection, whether they got medical therapy, this IMDC risk group, which again is the way we look at cancer, having more aggressive histology, and having multiple sites of disease. And this is shown here again, complete resection sort of makes a, a dramatic difference there. So this is one of my last uh, studies I'm going to sort of discuss with, is this a study that was published looking at targeted therapy, so again, medical treatment, following complete resection, only 19 patients had immediate post-operative treatment, and immediate post-operative treatment was associated with a better survival. But again, you need to be very careful. These are retrospective studies, selected patients. So it, it sort of guides us about potential of combination treatments, but it's not a definitive meaning. It's, you, you can't make over conclusions that this clearly is the way that we need to treat patients or, or that these are the right treatments that we need to be giving patients. And again, this is sort of to show you here, if you didn't have a complete removal, uh, if you had a complete removal and you get treatment, you clearly see the relapse rate was much, much higher versus... If you had a complete removal and got medical therapy, you clearly see the relapse rate was 20% versus about 80%. So in conclusions, the most common sites of metastasis of kidney cancer, as we sort of went in a chronological order, are the lungs, the bone, liver, pancreas, the retroperitoneum, the brain, and the head and neck. Complete surgical resection is really the primitive, uh, the essential component of how you're treated if you're going to have this type of treatment. And I definitely think some of these neadjuvant and adjuvant trials are very promising, particularly these adjuvant trials following metastasectomy. And there's two that were mentioned earlier. Keynote 564 and Motion 010 uh, may help us under understand the combinations of whether checkpoint, these immune modulators, may be important in these treatments. And I think this is a, a slide I like to always include because there's many factors when you're considering treatment, and, and particular aggressive surgery. Patient factors disease factors, uh, likelihood of, of complications with surgery, and then site-specific, meaning lung, bone, and brain, like we were discussing, clearly know how patients are, and there's a difference in prognosis depending on those sites. Lastly, this is a nice summary slide in terms of the treatments and different types based on the location. And just a brief uh, just uh, mention of, of a, I think, a mentor for many of us, Dr. Swanson, who's part of the KCA for many years, and dedicate a lot of his career to the, to the really focusing on metastasectomy and the treatment of kidney cancer. And I just want to definitely know that his, uh, his legacy is one that we definitely all sort of are striving for us to, to try to make an impact on the treatment of kidney cancer, particularly aggressive kidney cancer. So thank you very much for your time.